I'd like to welcome you to the Mount Carmel Church, our midweek Bible study. I'm glad that you're able to be with us today. We've had some wintry weather, and uh, I guess tomorrow and the next day is to be pretty warm, but uh, we're in March, and things can change day by day by day, but we are getting closer to spring. In fact, I heard uh, just a couple nights ago that we're about a week away from spring. So that is great to, to hear, and as we anticipate that, and as we see things starting to blossom and bud and flowers starting to come up, uh, just a great uh, sign for us of, of life and the importance of life. But I hope that to this morning, you, when you got up, you said, Lord, how can I be of service to you today? How can I glorify you? We want to just welcome you to our midweek Bible study. We are glad that you're able to watch and to listen. We not only have it on the uh, face or YouTube and Facebook on Wednesday nights, but we have it in our church building. And so be praying for those in our church building as they are praying for you on the, the internet. But let's have a word of prayer as we start our evening service, our evening Bible study. We'll be looking at the book of Philippians. We're working our way slowly through the book of Philippians and looking at this area of joy and hope in the middle of life. How do we find that joy and hope in the middle of our life, no matter where we're at, no matter what's happening? Well, this is a great uh, book of the Bible that talks about a lot about hope. It also gives us some very clear instruction on how to find that hope. But let's have a word of prayer tonight as we start our, our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. We thank you for this night. We thank you for the beautiful snow that many of us had yesterday and, <clears throat> and the night before and kind of this extended winter type weather <clears throat> and dear lord we thank you for that snow because as you provide snow lord you provide water for in the summertime and lord how important that is and we just thank you for the many seasons of the year dear lord the seasons that we have how that we see this take place and then this take place and Dear Lord, as we're coming to a, a time that's one of my favorite seasons, spring and then fall later on is my favorite season, but spring, how that we see so much start to, to grow and how that we see life. And Lord, sometimes if we're down through the winter times, it brings us um, life in our own lives as we think and, and just look and see things. But Lord, help us each and every day. If we know you as your personal Savior, our personal Savior, Lord, to to be looking to you for guidance and direction. Help us to <clears throat> not falter, but to know that we have life each and every day and that we can have that joy and hope through you. I pray tonight for those on that are struggling with health issues, Lord, or maybe just can't get out because of weather or maybe age or, or whatever it may be, Lord. We pray for them. We pray that uh, for your hand to be upon them Dear Lord, as we read in Scripture, we know that you are, you know each and everything about each and every one of us. And dear Lord, we ask for your continued guidance there. We thank you for all you do. And dear Lord, we want to lift your name up today in, in our time of, of looking at your word and looking at this book of Philippians. And dear Lord, ask we just ask for continued guidance in all that is said and all that is done today. Uh, we pray for our after school program at the church. Lord, and even though it's snowy out, I know there'll be some kids coming, and dear Lord, just a great time that that is, uh, helping with homework, and Lord, providing and, and, and uh, sharing the gospel with them. Dear Lord, what a, what a time of, of seeing open hearts that are absorbing what you have. Dear Lord, we just thank you for all you do. We pray for our churches in our area. Lord, uh, we pray for the pastors as we've went through this very tough time of having COVID and working around things, Lord. Help us to, pre to continue to present the gospel and not to change the gospel, but to present it as, as it is written. And dear Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for our time together. I pray for our school systems, Lord. I know some schools are off with spring break. I think of colleges. We pray for college students, young adults. We also pray for our, our school systems, Lord, that they would continue to look to you for guidance in everything that is said and done. And we pray for those 
that are teaching them, the teachers and the administrators, Lord, those that make decisions, along with our school boards. And I pray as Christians, Lord, that we would be involved in our schools and uh, continue to look to you for guides. And as we've looked on Sunday morning's revival, how important revival is in our lives, Lord, and it starts with that I and revival, and that's each and every one of us. Dear Lord, we pray for revival in this country, but most of all, we pray for revival in each one of us. And revival is our relationship with you as we are drawn closer to you. But we thank you for tonight. We thank you for our time together, that we can look to your word. And dear Lord, continue <clears throat> to look to your word and, and gain guidance and just gain a lot of uh, uh, challenges also to us um, that you are challenging us through your word, but how that our lives can be filled with joy and hope, even in whatever time of life we're in right now. And we thank you for all you do, in Jesus' name, amen. As I said, as we started, we're going to continue our study in the book of Philippians, and we will be doing that over the, the next number of weeks. But uh, we, we're looking at this area of joy and hope in the middle of life. You know, what is our identity? And you, you may ask, well, Pastor, what, what is identity? What does that mean? Well, it's kind of, what do people see us as? You know, if you look at a tombstone, you'll see a date of birth, and then you'll see a date of many times death, but there's a, a dash in the middle of that. You know, and I kind of look at our identity as being, what do people see in that dash in our lives? What, what will we be noted for? What will show up in our lives. Um, you know, we all have something in common. Unless Christ comes back, and if he comes back and takes us with him, then, then we won't see this, but we all have this in common, and that's death. We will all die sometimes, or sometime. And, uh, you know, as you think about that, someday, um, that decision that we've made in our lives will be right there before us, whether we've accepted Christ as our Savior or rejected Him. But you know, what do people see in us throughout our lives? We want to look at that in Philippians chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 27 through 30 tonight. Four verses as we finish up the, the first chapter of the book of Philippians. You know, as we look at our passage for today, Paul is reminding us that it is not just people who forget who they are. Sometimes we as Christians forget who we are as God's children. You know, how many times when you were growing up did your mom or dad tell you this? Act your age. Maybe you've heard that, or maybe when I say that, you know, you have that come to mind again. You know, act your age. You know, probably many times that's happened to all of us. But, but they likely also said you act like we know you can be. Or we act like we know how good you can be. They may have said that to you. you know, they probably didn't say it quite like that, but likely said it maybe this way, and I thought of a few of them. You know, when you're out with your friends, act in a way that will make us proud. Or, or don't behave in a way that will bring shame on the family. Or remember, you are, and you can finish that last name in there, you are... You know, and, and don't drag the family name through the mud. Those are some things that I think I've heard over the years with different parents saying to their children as they're, they're going out or as teenagers or, or whatever it may be. But in order for us to live lives worthy of the gospel, we must remember our identity, who we are in Christ. And as Paul wrote to the Philippians, what he's telling here is the primary point he's making is he's making that at the end of this chapter. How important it is your identity, and Christ is. You know, Paul challenged them with these words. In verse 27, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, basically, Paul was saying our identity should be Christ-like. In other words, he's saying conduct yourself in a way that is consistent with who you are 
and, and what you're about. But it's impossible for us to conduct ourselves in such a way if we don't remember who we are. So let me just read verses 27 through verse 30. I want to just have a little bit of review of the verses prior to that. And then we'll look at a couple of those factors in this tonight, and then we'll finish it up next week. But uh, follow along as I read, starting in verse 27, and I'll read down through verse 30. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. You know, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 26, that we've looked at the last couple of weeks, we saw three principles that will help us experience ever-expanding joy. We, we talked about that word expanding joy. In other words, continuing to increase in our joy daily or, or weekly or however it is, to continue to grow in our relationship with Christ, but to grow with that joy that only can, be, only can come from Him. The first thing I think we saw in those passages is something that we went to another passage of Scripture and looked at, was Romans chapter 8, verse 28, thinking that Paul had. And we, we looked at that because that's the attitude that Paul had. Because in Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. So we see that in his first, those 12 through verse 26, we see that type of attitude that, that Paul had. That no matter what was taking place in his life, he had that attitude of praising God and looking to God for what he, he would find or, or have in, in whatever circumstance he was in. The second thing we saw was having a gracious attitude, especially with those who view things differently than us. And we saw where Paul went through much in his life and where he went through a lot with being imprisoned and, and people that were making kind of fun of him and... and calling him different things, but yet he didn't, he didn't go after them. What he did was praising God that the gospel was being preached. You know, it wasn't about the Bible was being preached, but those people were jealous of him. So he kind of saw that, and he had a gracious attitude towards them. Then we saw where it keep our God confidence strong. That confidence in who God is in our lives. Keep a, a strong foothold in that, an understanding of that. You know, that God confidence in our lives can, can mean different things to us, but you know, do we have that confidence in our lives, or do we make God small in our lives? There was a, a book that was put out a couple of years ago that, that, that talked about God being small. Or is God small in your life, or is God large? I pray that you have that, that confidence, that God confidence, and it's strong in your life. Well, up to this point, Paul has been talking mostly about himself. But in verse 27, Paul shifts the focus to the Philippians. And because of Paul's example, this is how the Philippians were expected to live. And he, he did that because he put out an example to him, them. And we just read that in verses 27 through verse 30. So what I would like us to to look at is, is just some things about these verses. But first I'd like, to under, like you to underline three statements in your Bible. In verse 27, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Underline that, that word worthy. Also in verse 27 it says to stand firm, to stand fast or to stand firm. And how important that is. So I would ask you to underline stand fast or stand firm. And in verse 4, 29, it says this, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His name's sake. I'd like you to underline those words, suffer for His name's sake. You know, live worthy 
stand fast or firm and suffer for Christ. And that's some things as we look at these verses that are very, very important for us to, to kind of look at our lives. And, and we're going to look at three more words tonight in, in verse 27 and then look at some principles that we see here. But as we look at that and we look at those three things, live worthy, stand fast, suffer for Christ, that's a great thing to put in a foundation of our lives, isn't it? To live worthy, be willing to stand fast in what we believe, and sometimes we'll have to suffer for Christ and not walk away from those times. But tonight I want us also to notice three key words in that verse that create this clear and powerful command that we have in verse 27. The first key word is only, very, at the very beginning of that verse. It could be translated like just one thing. By using the word, Paul was saying, this is one thing I want you to focus on. Have you ever said to somebody, you know, now, now just concentrate on this, or it's just this one thing that I want you to do? Well, that's kind of what Paul is saying. Only. He's using that in, tra in, in the original translation means just one thing. The second key word that I want us to see is that word worthy. We've already underlined it. And I'd like you to put a square box around, if you have a pen or something, that word only. And then I'd like you to put a square box around the word worthy. Which literally means to even the beam. And it, what it's referring to is to be worthy. It, it refers to balancing the scales so that both sides are even. To live worthy of the gospel means to live so that your life gives proper weight to all the that God has done for you in Christ. In other words, what God has done for you in Christ, and, and you're living your life that way, that scale balances out. So that's what the word worthy means there. The third key word that I want us to do is just a couple words back, and that's conduct. Conduct. Paul used a very interesting word here for conduct or live. The word Paul normally used for this kind of point is one that means to walk about. To walk about. Like we find in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And let me just read verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. So we, we see that in, we see that area of walk worthy. What, what are we walking worthy of? Of the calling with which you were called. So we see where Paul used one that literally means to be a citizen or to perform your duties as a citizen. And kind of a question I wanted to ask, if you were arrested today for being a citizen of heaven, would there be enough evidence to convict you? You know, Christians should be living in such a way that there's no doubt they are citizens of heaven. So Paul's plea to the Philippians and to us is, remember who you are, remember where your citizenship really is, and conduct yourself in a manner worthy of your identity. In other words, who you are. Live your life as you, you show it. Live your life as you know inside. So the question comes up again, what is it, why is it important that we take this command so seriously? So pastor, you're asking me this question, why is it important that we take this command so seriously that Paul's plea to the Philippians here and to us is remember who you are, remember where your citizenship really is, and conduct yourself in a manner worthy of your true identity. Why is that important? Not only why is that important, but why should we take that seriously? you have an answer? The answer I would like to give you is because unbelievers draw conclusions about Jesus by the way we live. There was a song out many years ago that went and it sang about you may be the only Jesus that anyone, that, that anyone ever sees. Maybe that person that you're in contact with daily or maybe that person that's an acquaintance to you, you come in contact with, you know, they may be looking at who Christ is through you. 
So what kind of example? That's a challenge to us. It's a challenge to me. Because over the years, I haven't been, at times, in situations, the Christ-like person that I should have been. But unbelievers draw their conclusions about Jesus by the way we live. They draw their conclusions about Christians. I think we've all heard that statement made that, well, if that's what a Christian's like, I don't want to be like that. You know, salvation doesn't really make a difference in the way a follower of Jesus lives. Then why should other people take Jesus seriously? You know, this was important for Christians in the first century. And it continues to be important for Christians today as this world increasingly walks further and further away from God. You know, in the verses that follow verse 27, Paul describes some of the elements of worthy conduct that will help Christians have a greater impact on the watching world around us. And we want to look at those, but we also want to look at some in verse 27. The first one that we look at, worthy conduct. That word worthy conduct or conduct be worthy. What's some things we need to think about that worthy conduct? What should they include? Well, the first thing I want us to see is being consistent. In the last part of verse 27, Paul wrote this, So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. What did Paul expect that the Philippians would do? He expected them to stand firm, to persevere, to be consistent, and to be constant in, in their ability, not wavering one way or another. You know, a lot of people today waver. It's kind of like they want to sit on the top of that fence and whatever crowd they're with or whoever they're with, they kind of go to one side or the other of that fence. Well, the world is full of people who quit when the going gets tough. And they draw back when the battle heats up. But as Christians, we need to stand firm. You know, a wise teacher, I, I heard this once, a wise teacher said this to his young students, remember the postage stamp. It sticks to one thing until its job is done. Perseverance is certainly uh, something that conduct, that we need to have conduct that is worthy of the gospel, that perseverance, continuing on. You know, God will enable us to keep going, to stand firm and to not shrink back. And whenever the challenge, whatever the difficulty, regardless of the persecution or the pain, we must simply remain by standing firm. You know, God is pleased and will reward us if we are faithful to the end. I think of that, that thought of being persevering. You know, how many times have we been involved in something where we had to stand our ground and, and we've stood it? But are we standing it for Christ also? That's what he's ta telling us to do here. Only let your conduct be worthy or let your conduct or, or worthy be your conduct. Second, worthy conduct includes this, be cooperative. You know, at the end of verse 27, again, in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27, the end of it, it says, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit and one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We notice that worthy conduct is characterized by cooperation, and even more than cooperation, unity. You know, often when people are under pressure, it's easy to lose sight of the importance of standing together and of being unified. You know, sometimes when things get tough, we, we hear of people bailing out. You know, well, I didn't have anything to do with that, or I wasn't there, or, or whatever it may be. Well, in God's eyes, we need to be willing to stand together and to be unified together. You know, Paul was aware of the tensions that had arisen in Philippi concerning a dispute by at least two leading members of the church. In fact, in chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, we see that taking place. In fact, in verse 2 and 3, 
the church had been started by these two ladies, and now it was being torn apart by those two women. And the two of them are causing disruption in the church. But Paul urges that the body of Christ must strive for unity and salvation in spirit and in service. And in verse 4, he then goes back to where we can find the true joy. Flip over there just for a second. Because verse 4 then says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. You know, what had taken place in chapter 4 is one of the reasons he stressed unity and taught them how to have unity in chapter 2. One of Satan's favorite tactics is to divide and to conquer. You know, we see families today that are being torn apart, don't we? We see churches today that are being completely turn, torn apart. Well, one of Satan's favorite tactics in his life is to, to divide and to conquer. He knows that if he gets us fighting with each other in the church or in our families, then the church is weakened and made ineffective and unproductive. The same way with our personal lives. When he gets us fighting, we see families being torn apart. We see relationships torn apart. We see husbands and wives being torn apart. Torn apart. But call, Paul called for unity. He called for togetherness and he called for cooperation. He called for them to stand fast, firm in one spirit. Then he saw them so unified that they are striving together, contending as one. You know, when we are truly working as a team, we are then working together and great things can be accomplished. Perhaps Paul kind of envisioned an illustration from the, Roman, uh, the Romans. You know, often when under attack, they would draw close together in one small unit and they'd raise those large shields and they would advance together as, as a wall called a Roman wedge. Well, in order for that to take place, it takes both skill and cooperation to advance together as one. As we think of that illustration, you know, for the church to be effective in the world today, we must work as a team and be willing to work together. And we need to let the world be a place where people quarrel, fight, and divide, but let's have the church be a place where we are one in Christ. Let's also do that same thing in our family. Let those outside of our family quarrel and fight over things. And let's have peace in our family as we, we are Christ-like. And so as the citizens of heaven, Paul commands that we walk in a worthy manner by walking consistently and constantly and by walking cooperatively. In other words, coming together. Those are the areas that I'd like to, us to look at tonight, and I pray that tonight as we looked at those, you were encouraged by those. I pray that in your Bible you, you uh, underlined those words and those phrases that I want you to underline, and then you underlined those three words in verse 27. Only conduct and worthy. And then down at the end of that verse, stand fast in one spirit. I pray that you're doing that and that you're striving to be Christ-like in your life, in your attitude, in your character. Um, what does that look like? Do people say, boy, look at that person. They have something different that I want. That's what Paul was pointing out here. That's how we can have that joy and hope in our lives. Let's close in a word of prayer. Jeremy, Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for our time together. We just pray for this evening, Lord, as we looked at these verses and again looked at Paul and his instruction to us for this hope and, and uh, joy and peace that we can only find through you. Dear Lord, help us in our lives to be willing to have that worthy conduct that is glorifying you in all that we do. We thank you for those who are watching and listening tonight. Dear Lord, we just pray for them. I pray as uh, summer or spring comes upon us here pretty soon, as we see things starting to, to blossom and, and move, and as this Easter season comes up in another few weeks, Lord, I pray that as Christians we would be inviting others to either share and, and watching on Facebook or YouTube uh, the gospel, 
or inviting them to go out to a church. And I, dear Lord, I pray for those that don't have a, a church family, that they would look in their area for a Bible-believing church, Lord. And I, I pray for the Mount Carmel Church, that we would be willing to share and to reach out into our community. And dear Lord, we just thank you for who you are. And dear Lord, we pray for each and every Christian watching, Christ follower watching, that as we look at Paul building this foundation in our lives as far as some things that we should use as stones in our foundation, Lord, I pray that they are evident in our lives. We thank you for all that was said in, in your word tonight. And dear Lord, we just pray for this upcoming week that we would honor you in everything that is said and done. We just thank you for all that you do for us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to thank you for watching and listening tonight. And as we continue through our book of, of Philippians, we'll be looking next week at, at those same verses 27 through 30 because there's a lot packed into those verses that Paul is pointing out to not only the, the church of Philippi, but I believe to each and every one of us. Thank you for watching and listening, and may God bless.